So this is our weekly legislative update for January 19th. Thank you all for coming. I wanted to quickly update you all. Legislator emails have been updated. Uh, they've been changed from essentially first name dot last name at mtleg.gov to first name dot last name at legmt.gov. And I wanted to assure you our online tool has been updated. And if you use the messaging tool on the legislature's website, that's going to still make it to legislators. But if you're in the habit of emailing legislators straight from your personal inbox, just make sure you have the right email address just to make sure that they're getting your comments. Um, I posted this uh, image on our social posts, all of our social media, so you can share those. You can let your contacts, lists, family, friends know. We want to make sure that your comments are getting through. So, uh, great. I just wanted to quickly say that. And here's a big one. What does Northwestern Energy's announcement from earlier this week mean for legislation? I'm going to hand this off to Ann. Uh, good afternoon, almost evening, everyone. Um, I, I first, before we go any further, I don't think we have ever um, introduced Matthew Cassini. Um, Matthew is our legislative assistant for this session. Um, he has been doing great work. He helped organize the lobby day today. Thanks to all of you who are there. Um, it was a great turnout. It was a really fun event. It's you know, it recharges our batteries to interact with all of you um, in person and on Zoom. And I just want to say thank you to Matthew for putting in a lot of time and effort to make that all come together. And if you don't know Matthew yet, you may be hearing from him over the course of the session. Um, so Matthew, can you just say hi so everyone can see what you look like? Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks to everyone who showed up today. Like Anne said, it really is why we do this is to meet everyone who's helping us fight this good fight together. It really does recharge your battery. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Matthew. We just have the best, most fun, wonderful, smart team over here. We're just, we feel very fortunate. Um, we did not feel fortunate about the announcement that Northwestern Energy made this week um, at the Northwestern slash Coal Strip, um, you know, legislator party on Monday evening. Northwestern announced that it is going to be buying Avista share. Um, Avista is a public utility that operates in Idaho and in Washington state. Avista has been saying for years that coal strip is too expensive and the sooner it gets out, the better it would be for its customers. Um, Avista just a few years ago, I can say was very much in line with Northwestern in being that utility that wanted to keep the plant running and didn't want to admit a change in energy systems um, were coming down the pike. And Avista really changed its tune about, uh, Two, maybe three years ago and started doing the math on coal strip and figuring out that it was really a terrible use of its customers money um, and it was making rates go up and would make rates go up even more if it held on to it so it's not surprising that avista managed to cut a deal um, what's what's appalling is that northwestern wants to pick this plant up and is out there telling everyone it's going to be for zero dollars um, but of course northwestern isn't counting for um, operations of an aging plant that is subject to very expensive breakdowns um, or a facility where it pays, you know, hundreds over way over hundred million dollars a year for fuel, um, where, you know, wind farm, a solar um, facility or a battery that's filled with wind or solar, solar none of them have fuel costs. Um, and so Northwestern is buying a dog of a plant. I just want to say that they are doing it on top of its request for 25% increase in rates um, from customers for electricity from its residential customers um, right now. And on so Northwestern is buying the trying to get customers on the hook for the Yellowstone generating station. Um, that's the Laurel gas plant. Um, and wants, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars just to build that facility. 
And now it also wants to charge us uh, for more of the coal strip plant. And you know, when we get a Vista share, Northwestern will suddenly have a 50% share in coal strip unit four, which is the unit that is subject to the break to breakdowns most frequently. And when you own 50% of that plant, you pay for 50% of not just the operation and maintenance, but to fix it when it breaks. That means us customers have to pay that fee. So, um, and it's also going to be owning a, or sorry, it's 45%. Avista owns 15% of the plant now. And then uh, Northwestern will be getting a share of unit four, a 15% share of unit, I'm sorry, of unit three, ah, late in the day. Um, Northwestern currently does not have an ownership interest in coal strip unit three. Um, this acquisition would allow it to do so. What I can say is this acquisition isn't actually a done deal yet. This doesn't go into effect until the end of 2025. Actually, it's January 1st, 2026. Um, that's when Northwestern would take over a Vista share and have to start paying more um, to operate that plant. But it does appear that we may be paying more between now and that time because a Vista is not going to be picking up all of the costs to maintain that plant because it is not allowed to recover costs from its customers if those costs prolong the life of the plant. And so there is something in this deal that says Northwestern is gonna pick up those extra costs. And let me tell you, it's not Northwestern shareholders, it's gonna be Northwestern's customers. Um, we are, we are you know, Northwestern at some point is gonna to have to come to the Public Service Commission and ask to pass these costs onto customers. We will be there. They have to negotiate a coal contract with Westmoreland. Um, the last one that they had to renegotiate took a decade. They now only have a couple more years. Um, they have to have finalized the coal um, contract with the Rosebud Mine um, by the end of 2024. So, and then Avista has to go through its utility commission. So there's a number of hurdles that both utilities have to go through between now and when this is a done deal. And trust me, we will be watching every step of the way. Um, this is just a utility we can't afford, plain and simple. I'm gonna now pass it off to DERF and we can, I can talk more about this in questions and answers, but we have a lot to cover. So DERF is gonna give a brief synopsis on what's going on with constitutional changes, DERF. So <clears throat> the deadline for actually introducing constitu constitutional referenda into the legislature is March 28th at this point in time. And that is subject to change based upon um, if the legislature decides not to meet, et cetera. But that's the current date, which is actually quite a bit of a ways out. Um, and so we need to be on our toes until then. However, I wanted to give you guys just a rundown of where things are at with the constitution um, and where things might go. And frankly, not a lot has changed since the last time we spoke last week. Um, it's sort of a status quo. Nothing has been introduced in regard to the Constitution. Um, however, uh, there's there's two major amendments that we're looking at right now that would deal directly with the clean, healthful environment provision or um, generally how um, well land use occurs and planning. Um, the first being a, a, an amendment from Representative Gunderson that would um, amend, and we're not sure how, the actual clean and healthful claim um, or the clean and healthful right. And that language hasn't even been drawn up yet. It's still on hold. The other one is um, a Becky Beard amendment that would uh, change the preamble in the Constitution to insert the right to a clean, or excuse me, the right to acquire, use, and uh, possess property. It's, it's really a one or two word addition. Uh, um, and that one is actually really significant because it deals a lot with um, planning, for example, as well as takings and government re regulation. It could have a really significant implication for a lot of our work. With that one, what, what we're, <laughs> the scuttlebutt at the Capitol that we're sort of, sort of hearing is that industry has a lot of problems with it because, um, well, for example, Oil and gas companies often own the mineral estate, but not the not the uh, surface uh, ownership, and so the, there can be a lot of problems posed with uh, 
the somebody having the right to to use the property as they see fit without taking into account other ownership interests in that property. And so that one is being redrafted and there's a lot of infighting going on over um, whether or not that's even a good idea. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that. But again, March 28th is sort of the drop deadline right, right, right now. And uh, we will uh, be fighting back anything we can. We need to get 51 votes. That's the, uh, that's the magic number. 51 votes against is less than the two thirds that they will need to proceed. And so we're actively working to build up that coalition of folks at this point in time. Did I want to take a question from Bob? And then we can go on. Yeah, go for it. Bob Horn. Who's on mute and his hands raised. Hey, Bob. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me, Jeff? Okay. Um, this is kind of a big ball to get into, but I'll just throw the question out there and you can maybe think about it for later. Uh, anything that would add the right to use land added into the Constitution, how much effect would that have given the fact that we have almost 100 years of jurisprudence on land use, on the what, what is a reasonable use? And you don't have a right to the, the most uh, profitable use, but you do have a right to a reasonable use. So just, yeah, again, you don't have to tackle it now if you don't want to, but how do you, how do you think that that, that would uh, maybe come down given all that uh, case law that we have behind us? That's a darn good question. And I've thought about this quite a bit. And I think in part, Bob, the answer is it depends on who's right in the new jurisprudence. And this particular court has <laughs> endeavored to go a little bit more moderate and there's a big effort to change its composition. And so if a new Montana Supreme Court has a different posture, they may come up, you know, they may have said if, if it were to pass and be law, they may, you know, set aside some of that jurisprudence. So in large part, that's a, that's a crystal ball sort of prediction. Um, but I would say it injects a lot of uncertainty into uh, a lot of that, you know, what we would consider firm uh, law, stare decisis, that's been around for a long time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and I, I think we can move to the next, next uh, subject. <clears throat> oh, this is me. I'm very good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Lund. I'm the MEIC Energy Policy Director. I'm um, just going to go through a list of bills that impact <clears throat> energy policy in the state. We're going to start with bills we, we support. Um, uh, right now, there's only one bill that we support relating to energy policy, and that is SB 147, which creates state energy conservation standards. Um, I believe this is the only bill introduced right now that would actually potentially have the effect of lowering rates, um, which, you know, as we know, are set to increase by 25% for Northwestern customers. Um, this bill would essentially formalize some of the energy efficiency and conservation programs that Northwestern is already doing, albeit to sort of a minimal degree. And it would just increase the threshold for it would set a 1% amount of energy conservations that has, like, that has to be achieved um, every year. And, and they can meet that 1%. So that's 1% of a total of all their energy sales. Um, and this is really common across the country. Um, about 20 states have something like this. And the amount of you know, the conservation standard ranges from 0.5% up to 4%. And um, we find think that one percent is completely reasonable. Northwestern is already saving about 0.7 percent uh, on an annual basis, and so this isn't really a stretch for them. Um, but it would be really helpful in getting them to think about energy conservation as a resource, getting the PSC to think about energy conservation as a resource, um, and get us on the path of being more thoughtful about how we use energy. The really good thing about energy conservation, why it's so important to our broader 
mission um, of fighting climate change is that it defers the need to build new generation infrastructure. So if you're using less energy, then you don't need to build another power plant as soon or as large because, and you know, because you're using less energy. And you know, if you're building old wind and solar, that's great. But as we can see, uh, Northwestern has an interest in buying more coal, running that coal plant more, uh, building a new gas plant, running that gas plant. So as much energy as we can say, as we can conserve, that is more energy that we don't need to use. Um, more fossil fuels we don't need to burn. Next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> here's our list of bills that we are not so thrilled about. Um, I'm just starting at the top. SB 97 had a hearing um, yesterday morning, actually, to increase taxes on large scale renewable projects by 500%. Um, there's currently a like 0 0.002 cents per kilowatt tax on um, wind or all renewable energy production, uh, which will apply both solar and wind and a bunch of other potential renewable projects that we don't actually have in the state. Um, and, but we don't really have that many solar projects. So this will mostly apply to wind. And we had a ton of people come into the hearing yesterday um, the wind developers mostly, and they were strident <laughs> about how this bill would make Montana much, much less competitive for wind development. The whole idea of this bill is to increase the tax on wind so that they can lower property taxes for people living in counties near where the wind farm is built. Um, but the reality is that if these projects are made not viable by being uncompetitive because we are competitive competing Montana is competing for tax revenue from these wind projects with many other states um, around the region which you know Montana has an excellent wind resource but many other states have good wind resource as well um, and so if we were to pass this tax which is supposed to increase revenue we actually might miss out on revenue because future projects don't get built here um, HB 241 is a bill that bans solar and EV ready building codes. So last summer, the Montana Department of Labor and Industry passed, um, they, they made a rule which created, it, it updated the building codes that um, local governments need to subscribe to for new construction. And as part of these new building codes, which included a lot of actually, you know, good things for energy efficiency and of new buildings and whatnot. Um, they passed a code that was an optional stretch code that allows um, jurisdictions, local governments to, if they so choose to, if the, the, the community wants to, um, pass what's called a solar ready stretch code. And this means that a building or a development if this city has this rule, would have to build their city, their new, sorry, they have to build their new buildings or new homes or whatnot with not solar panels, but just with the roof ready to accept solar panels should the new tenants of these buildings want to go solar. Um, so it just sort of sets up the wiring and the roof space and make sure there's no like skylights in the middle of the roof or something. So if you want to just put solar in your roof, it's really easy and cheap. Um, Is it some of the bills that they're proposing the public and such? Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, Increase the so th this, this bill can, is sort of a more, it fits into this broader pattern of um, pushback on local control that has the effect or, or the intention of also setting us back in terms of making climate progress. So we have some, you know, our Bozeman's and Missoula's of Montana, which, you know, sort of are running counter to the dominant, you know, philosophy of the, of the state in which they are actually trying to make climate progress. And they have all these avenues to do this. Um, and Solar Ready is one of them. And the state is, lawmakers are trying to sort of clamp down on that, that freedom of government that they have of local control. Um, HB 178 is sort of a similar vein. It prevents local governments and the PSC from regulating um, crypto mining. And so crypto mines are, if you don't know, 
basically rooms full of computers, which can go up to warehouses full of computers that basically solve equations all day to create sort of your Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies. Um, they require a ton of energy and a ton of like cooling, um, which is basically fans on the top of your building, which can be really loud. Um, and we, Montana is actually, Missoula, Montana is one of the first cities in the country, perhaps maybe still the only, to have made a requirement that if there was a crypto farm in their uh, jurisdiction, they would have to be powered by renewable energy. Um, this bill would make that not possible for other counties, to, other cities or counties to do. Um, basically just saying, hey, you can't touch this. We think cryptocurrency is good. No local control shall be used to um, stop its development. And then there's also the PSC restriction, which would prevent the PSC from making rates specific to cryptocurrency mining operations, which is a, a huge problem because these operations plug into the grid and they can suck up the amount of energy used by an entire neighborhood um, and it's running 24 seven. So it, it makes no sense to prevent the PSC from making a specific rate class for what is a very unique industry. Um, so we oppose this bill. And moving right along, do, if you, do you need me to speed up, um, guys? Or are we going to? No, we're going to talk. Um, OK, HB 220, establish a partisan committee on energy resource planning and acquisition. Um, we're pretty sure this one is coming directly from Northwestern. Uh, we talked about this last week, but we call this the spoiled child syndrome bill because essentially the legislature passed a bill in 2019 that rewrote the energy basically how northwestern gets its plants approved and how it selects new generation and it makes them go through a competitive um, bidding process in which they have to evaluate a whole bunch of different resources and anyone can sort of sign up and it just doesn't and it's, it's transparent and there's an independent monitor and the PSC is able to like look at all the options and basically it just doesn't let Northwestern build whatever it wants, which is what it wants to do. Um, doesn't want to be restrained. And that leads to decisions that aren't best for the ratepayer. Um, so anyway, <laughs> the, the 2019 law was passed and then Northwestern fought it tooth and nail through the Public Service Commission over the course of two or three years. Um, the rules just got approved in December. And so basically, we call it spoiled child syndrome because they went to the legislature, which is like their dad and their dad said no. And then they went to the PSC and mom said no. And now they're coming back to dad, the legislature and saying, hey, what if we put together a committee to rewrite these rules? Because these rules just aren't working for anyone. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> we don't think that we we don't think that this sort of entitlement should necessarily be rewarded. Um, and HB 284 is to reestablish pre-approval. So as some of you may or may not know, um, the, the way that Northwestern has typically gotten the resources approved has been through what's called pre-approval, which you they come up with an idea for a plant, they submit it to the PSC, and then the PSC approves it. And after that, Northwestern would then go and start building the plant. So this Law only applied to Northwestern, not um, the other investor-owned utility, MBU. And so this was struck down um, for being special legislation last year. Um, and so basically they're coming back and they're saying, let's make this apply to both investor-owned utilities. Now it's not special legislation. Um, and we're still not sure what we're going to do on this bill. Pre-approval has its benefits. It has its drawbacks. Um, this policy could definitely be improved. Um, so I think we're going to try to do something to that effect, um, but we're not really sure um, what that'll look like yet. Ah, uh, this looks like my slide. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I am Ann Schwen, the Sustainable Communities Policy Director, um, Sustainable Communities and Land Use Planning. Uh, a couple of bills that we covered last week, um, Senate Bill 130, which was consolidating local planning boards. Uh, we felt like this is actually something that's valuable in 
our rural communities and smaller communities, uh, particularly since they are primarily advisory. Um, Senate Bill 130 was heard and passed second reading today on the Senate floor, as well as Senate Bill 131 and Senate Bill 152. Those are just carryovers from um, last week. And then the next one is uh, that was heard this week in the Senate local government um, is administrative review of minor subdivisions. And this is something that was coming out of the governor's um, housing task force and basically the cut red tape initiative and trying to figure out ways that we can expedite the process. And although I'm often suspicious of that, this bill I think is pretty good. It really is saying um, subdivisions, minor subdivisions, basically anything that is less than five lots that is within most of the time in municipality, but the definition is really someplace where there is existing water and sewer. So sometimes public water and sewer, uh, there may be some places in the county where this applies, but there needs to be zoning in place. They can't be requesting any variances and it needs to be compliant with the county growth or with the um, local growth policy. This, um, this bill, Senate Bill 170, um, we felt like is a pretty good bill. You know, it really is trying to encourage infill in density within existing footprints. One caveat though, um, as always, and I brought it up, you know, just a little bit of concern and the bill sponsor uh, is willing to take a friendly amendment on this. So we're working with them on that um, and the Montana Association of Counties um, about the public process, mostly about the public's right to know, because at this point in time, um, there isn't a process where the planning department or the administrator, the administrator that would be reviewing this minor subdivision notifies um, adjacent landowners. And I think that that's a, an important piece. So if you have a vacant lot next door to you, I would assume that you'd like to know um, what might be going in if that's a small development per se, or a couple of lots. So hopefully we're gonna see an amendment on that that does uh, outline what that public's right to know would be. Um, bills that we are opposing, uh, House Bill 211, uh, which is basically the concern that we have there. This is one uh, that had three parts to it. And um, the three sections are, how do you handle new information and hearings? And that's where we have a lot of concern because the way that the bill is written at this point, there are some amendments that are being made to that, is that it allows the um, governing body to determine what constitutes um, material effect. Uh, I understand that they are actually changing that to substantial new information. And then how does that new information, do they do the, the governing body would determine if that new information um, should be considered in allowing that subdivision um, to move forward or whether there will be adverse impacts from that new information. We believe that the public should have the right to know what that new information is and to see that information um, rather than just the governing body making that decision. Um, but there are some parts of the bill that we did like, uh, which is basically when there is, uh, it was defining, more clearly defining when a hearing is needed for subsequent review in phased subdivisions. And um, if there are subsequent in those phases, um, whether, <clears throat> um, let's see what they, uh, oh, I know what it was that the um, governing body will be allowed to impose new conditions um, when they when those new phases are coming in. Uh, right now, they're allowing up to five years for those new phases to come in before really looking at those. Um, the suggestion has been to move that back to three years to match the current Subdivision and Platting Act. And then um, it also defines a way that they are allowing variances in the expedited review. Right now, if you have a variance, if you're trying to do an expedited review, you can't do it. Um, 
And so most people haven't been using that process. The last one is Senate Bill 158, um, which is adding more exemptions to the subdivision law. This is really um, about family exemptions. This is a bill that was brought forth by Senator Ellsworth. Um, and he basically was proposing that if you have a subdivision or if you live in a subdivision um, and the subdivision allows smaller lots, that you can divide up your lot in that subdivision and transfer that to your family members, your wife or any of your children. It has to be immediate family members. The parcels that you break off may not be smaller than five acres. Um, but you can do that basically using the family transfer and exemption law. And as usual, we really don't support um, using the exemptions, particularly if it's going to result in multiple additional lots. Um, I mean, if you just think about a subdivision where everybody is currently has, a you know, 20 acres and each of them divide their lots um, three more times, adding you know, five acre parcels within their 20 acres, if the entire subdivision did that and no one had to go through additional review to understand what those adverse impacts would be, and particularly the cumulative adverse impacts to both water and roads and wildlife and whatever, uh, we just feel like there really needs to be a more thorough review of that. So those are the things that we are um, watching and participating in this week, and we would uh, urge you to contact your legislators and let them know how you feel about them. Thanks. Thank you. We have a couple more slides before we'll remove the screen share and uh, ask your, like, your questions. Um, we're looking for people who want to write LTEs or sign LTEs um, on any number of these issues or the other things that we're working on. So is there something tonight that you connected with that you have a personal story about? Um, please reach out. I'll put my email in the chat. And I noted that uh, my messages look like they're coming from Anne tonight, but they are also coming from me. Sorry if that's confusing. Um, yeah, thank you. An LTE is the letter to the editor. So a lot of them will get printed in your newspaper, but a lot of them also appear online and will be shared on social media and be seen by your, your neighbors. Um, so yeah, let us know if you're interested in that. We're happy to help. If you've never done it before and still wanna give it a try, don't, don't be scared. That's what we're here for. So just a quick plug for that. Um, tomorrow is Climate Advocacy Day uh, in Helena. You can go see Anne and a number of other folks speak and it should be a good crowd. So hopefully we get a good turnout for that. And then just our contact information, I can put this in the chat if you don't have it already. Just wanted to quickly put it up there, plug to support our work. We appreciate that you're all here learning already. That's good support. And then ways you can stay connected. And we, we've covered all this and I just wanted to have it up here for a second to remind you that there's lots of ways to be involved and lots of ways to share information and be connected. But I think we should go to questions. I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Um, so you're welcome to put them in the chat. You're also welcome to come off mute. You can use the reactions to raise your hand and we can take people in order or we can just uh, go for it. Went through a lot of dense legislation tonight. I see a question from Gary. When's the best time to contact your legislator about a bill? Is it after it passes committee? You know, Gary, that will depend on whether your legislator is on the committee. Um, I'd say the best time to contact your legislator if they're on the committee is before the hearing on that committee. Um, and then maybe again after the hearing. But if your legislator is not on the committee, then the best time to contact them is the day before or a couple days before it is expected to come to the full floor of that body, whether it's the Senate or the House for a vote. Cool. 
question from Matthew in the chat. Where can we find information associated with Northwestern Energy's maintenance of their additional coal strip purchase? We can't. <laughs> Very handy. Um, so there are ways to tease that information out. It's very difficult to do. Northwestern tries to hide it. So we are um, we are pushing back in the rate case that Northwestern has right now before the Public Service Commission. MEIC is being represented by Earth Justice. Um, most of our focus in that rate case this go round is on the Laurel Generating Station, now called the Yellowstone Valley or County Generating Station. Um, the gas plant outside of Laurel um, that Northwestern wants to have customers pay for before the PSC um, says that it's even prudent, <laughs> which is a really backward way in utility regulation to go about trying to force customers to pay for something. Um, but in the rate case, Northwestern put forward a rate case this time, and I, I am certain it was intentional, that is a beast. Um, it is both electric and gas, um, both sides of their business, the electric and the gas side of their business. And it is a really large, complicated rate case. Somebody told me yesterday, it's the most complicated rate case they've ever seen um, as somebody who does this in the Pacific Northwest. So what they do is they hide those numbers on how much it costs to operate coal strip um, what their maintenance costs are. They just don't like saying that because those are really big numbers. Um, when Northwestern comes forward to the Public Service Commission to try to put uh, an additional share of coal strip in rates, that is something we absolutely will be able to drill down into. But for now, you know, we just know it's a lot of money. We know how much fuel has cost in previous years. Um, you know, I think two years ago, fuel was running at about $150 million a year um, for the plant to buy coal and Northwestern share was 15% of that. So um, it's not chump change, um, but we will keep you posted as we learn more. John, um, the question in the chat is, does Northwestern need to approve PSC uh, or does it need PSC approval for this deal? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Northwestern sim cannot simply put additional costs into rates without Public Service Commission approval. But when Northwestern comes forward asking to put the additional share of coal strip into rates, um, it is unclear to us at what point they're gonna have to come forward. I think they probably are going to come forward before the deal um, is solidified on January 1st of 2026, um, but we don't know yet. We still have a few minutes if you have any other questions. We are tracking a lot more legislation than we're sharing about tonight. This is just some of the biggest most important, fastest moving bills. And I'll say that there's, a, unless somebody has a question, I'll just fill you in. The session, as it usually does, is pretty slow um, at, the, at the start. Uh, things always pick up closer to February. Very few entities want to go first and submit bills that can get lots of scrutiny because legislators have more time than they will in about a month. That said, and Schwann's arena of um, land use related bills are coming fast and furious. She is up at the Capitol constantly. There's, there are a lot of bills that she is tracking. There seems to be some um, willingness to amend some of those bills. Um, you know, when they amend the bills though, you know, we're always declaring a victory when they amend a bill, but we still don't support the bill because there's still some bad language in it oftentimes. So while amendments are great, um, they usually, especially this session, aren't fixing the whole problem. So energy and land use are probably our two fastest moving arenas right now, but there's more. Um, there's a lot more bills that are in that are kind of like, eh, um, not quite as, as important as these areas, but 
we anticipate in the coming weeks, we're going to be seeing a lot more. Um, I see Max and, has a question. And I was just going to, before, before we go to Max, I would just add that comment that what we are seeing this year, of course, this is my first time um, lobbying, but I'm just astonished at how quickly bills are are getting um, introduced, assigned to committees, and then they're being heard in the committees, and they are um, being passed out of committee. And I would—I forgot to say that about Senate Bill 158, um, which was the revised family transfer, that got heard in committee and voted on and moved out in the same hearing. And it's pretty astonishing. So the, going back to that question about when is the best time to contact your legislator, it may be whenever you hear about something. <laughs> it's true. This the, and stuff especially is moving really quickly. They are moving bills faster than I've ever seen at the beginning of the session, um, from introduction to hearing to moving them to the floor. So, um, you know, when we say contact your legislator and committee, and you go and you see that it already passed committee. We apologize. It's just really hard to keep track. And the Legislative Services website is really slow this year. They really are, are struggling to keep up with the bills that are moving. They can't, they can't move as quickly as the bills are moving. Let's just say that. So now, Max. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ann. Um, <clears throat> two questions. Sorry, my, my video is doing that. I don't know what it's, Zoom was weird. Um, and I wondered, I listened to uh, a couple of the hearings last week. I wondered, wondered what happened to the changing what's needed to change a citizen initiated zoning uh, district. Did that move out of committee? Ann, you're on mute. Yeah, no, I think, um, well, Ann Hedges went in to um, speak on that, and I don't think right. that it has moved out of okay. committee. But I just think it may have moved. There is an amendment that has gone on it that um, prohibits, it, it's, a, it's a minor amendment, yeah. but it at least says that they, you know, you can't have somebody protest a citizen initiated zoning district with only 20% of the people and then just keep coming back to the right, county right, commission right, to say, right. we need a vote. So they changed it to the commission does not have to allow a public vote on that district to dissolve it um, uh, any more frequently than every three years, which is still right. frequently. <laughs> yeah, okay. And they did not change the 20% threshold for forcing the commission to you know, that's have gonna a be public a, vote on that. That's going to be a really interesting to see how that plays out. Um, yeah, you little, know, Max, these, we have a lot of these 30-year-old, I'm in one, citizen-initiated zones in the Valley, and most of the people living in them weren't part of the people that actually created the initial you know zone so who knows what people's thinking is about those areas i think those areas are grandfathered under the bill oh they are they okay are well, that, that, yeah. that changes it a lot okay so it, the other it helps, I, the other question i had and i don't know what the best way i'm trying to stay focused on this land use stuff and Anne, is there a way is there any way to see those land use bills coming down in some consolidated place without having to just to mention that they're there without having to analyze them or, or talk about them or um max that's a great i mean it's a great question and i wish that i could say that i was organized enough to be you know having a running track of them and then sending them out um quickly but uh they really are coming in pretty fast i see a little bit of a pause right at the moment um, and so maybe it'll give me a chance to catch my breath. And is Mako, is Mako covering them? Um, Mako yeah. is covering them. The other place, and we don't always agree with them, but um, mm -hmm. the Montana Association of Planners mm -hmm. um, is tracking them. But really, I mean, they are, I think it was, um, oh, it was House, but it was Senate Bill 170. Uh, I think was introduced on Monday and then on Tuesday it was in committee, yeah, right? Well, so, I mean... So it's even hard if you're just going to the legislative site. It's hard uh, to even keep up to the, yeah, the and, legislative And, and I noticed this but, year that when you go to a committee meeting, I think last year there was usually an agenda of what bills were there and now you don't even know until they start, 
which is very now, frustrating. The yeah. other thing that we're finding out is that they're also changing the times of the committee hearings. Oh my gosh. And you may not know that unless you listen yeah. into the floor sessions. Like today, they had the Senate floor session, and then at the end, they made the announcements and they said, okay, Fish and Wildlife is going to meet in 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody else is going to meet at 2.30. And okay. uh, and so it, it's this, you need yeah. to be constantly paying attention. Okay. So, okay. Um, well, Max, thank you. I'd recommend also looking at our website. Um, our Katie website, groups, yeah. yeah, Katie groups bills by issue area. And okay. we have one issue area of land use. And we right. try to put up what we think are the most significant bills. Okay. Um, with a brief description. And there's a, a way to link through to the bill. Okay. All righty, thanks. Yeah, you bet. We had a question from Will in the chat. Isn't there a scheduled overhaul of coal strip unit three before 2026? And who would pay for that? <laughs> Will, you know, I saw your question and it made me go, oh yeah, um, yes, I believe there is. I need to go back and look at that. Um, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts that Northwestern's gonna pay a portion of a VISTA share. Um, and try to hide that in its when it comes to the commission and ask for um, everything to be rate based. So it, that is something that I need to put on my list of things to look out for. Thanks for that heads up, Will. Great. Thanks. Anybody go to conservation lobby day today? Have an experience you wanna share, meet up with some legislators? It's okay if you don't wanna share. We're gonna have some more. We'll have one February 24th and March 15th. So if you're interested in getting up to the Capitol meeting with some of our experts talking about issues and then hunting down some legislators in the halls, um, there's still opportunities to do that. They're a really good time. I had a, a personal recommendation for them from Durf today, who said it's one of his favorite things to do with our members. It's true. Not one of, it is my favorite membership <laughs> thing to do. I love it. Well, if there are no more questions. Yeah. It looks like Max might have one more, or Max, is that? legacy hand raise. Yeah, sorry, it didn't come down, sorry. That's okay. No worries. I was just gonna say if no one else has questions, um, we can call it early tonight. I'll stop recording here in case you have a question you wanna ask.